start us off. Thank you, Marie. Such a pleasure to be here and such a privilege to be on this panel with Dr. Peary, who is someone whose vision for Zambia and whose person I admire a lot, and um, Dr. McConka, who, as Mary mentioned, uh, had just was appointed on Friday acting permanent secretary, and I just talked to him this morning. Fortunately, the Minister of Health is also out of the country, so he basically is the Ministry of Health now, and he couldn't leave the country, but he sends his great regrets. He really wishes he could be here, and he asked me to convey some of what he would have said to you. Um, he is someone who has... So I've been working in Zambia since 2005, and he has supported the research um, in such a strong way. He is such a model of a policymaker that is open to uh, evidence and to research, and we've been collaborating for a long time. I will talk about a particular collaboration that we've embarked on, on community health worker strategy. But before that, I'll talk about a collaboration that we have with Society for Family Health. Both of these are motivated by the dire shortage in um, countries around the world, and especially in Africa, of healthcare workers. So Africa carries 24% of the world's disease burden, but only 3% of the world's health workers. And in Zambia, where we're working, um, for a population of 12 million, there are 646 doctors. That is, for every 100,000 Zambians, there are less than seven doctors and 113 nurses. And we have the director of nursing for Zambia here, and she can attest to the challenges that the human resources sector faces in Zambia. This undermines efforts for all kinds of things, as you can possibly imagine. But there are so many diseases, uh, including malaria, HIV, for which we have very, very simple treatments and prevention, which could be undertaken by people with not as much training as doctors or nurses. And thus, there is the need to really uh, think about more innovative channels. And uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about today are two field experiments that uh, work on training and incentivizing individuals that are embedded in their communities to provide these kinds of health services. Um, and as I said, we, we need to search for these new channels new possible innovative channels. And the first field experiment I'll talk about is using the private sector channel. And the question is there, and I'll tell you exactly what channels we use with Society for Family Health in a randomized evaluation. But the big question there is, okay, so we're going to use the private sector channels. Do we motivate them using the same incentives as we would using any other private sector channel? They are providing health services delivery, some kind of service to the community. How do we think about them as agents of sales, of change in their communities, and how do we incentivize them? And that is a randomized evaluation that I'll speak about. And then in the public sector, because there is a public sector, it's, it's there and strong, and there is, in fact, a very large initiative that has been three years in, and actually much longer, as, as you can attest, Dr. Leto, um, in the making for a nationwide community health worker strategy to basically train a new cadre of, so previously Zambia's had just community health volunteers, and this is to train a new cadre that would be a basically six month to one year training, um, that would be an intensive training, to take on a lot of the tasks that had um, been sort of missing in the health sector. And this project in fact arose from Dr. Mokonka, who halfway through the project that we were doing with Society for Family Health, um, called me into his office, and said, I heard you're doing this project on uh, incentive design for uh, distribution agents in Lusaka. We'd like you to do the same thing for this community health worker project that we have. And I was daunted by the task because it's a nationwide project. But together, we designed something to help shed some insight on the very difficult task ahead of selection and recruitment and retention of community health workers uh, in designing compensation. So we'll talk about that at the end. Okay. So the first field experiment is called No Margin, No Mission, with a question mark, because um, this was a, a general statement of uh, Population Services International, which is an, an international NGO, um, of which Society for Family Health in Zambia is a local affiliate. And the idea was, you know, Population Services International has generally thought about using private sector methods um, for all kinds of service delivery, especially health service delivery. And one of the principles was, if you don't give people a margin, in fact, you can use the private sector method of giving people margin in order to give them a mission. So you can imagine this is completely different from our standard models 
of, of public health service delivery. Um, and we wanted to ask the question, is that true? That if you don't have a margin, you have no mission? Um, and that's exactly what we try to test in this field experiment. So in collaboration with Society for Family Health, um, we, we have put this field experiment together. This is a setting in which there is a very high rate of HIV AIDS, a prevalence of 14.3% in Zambia, um, as in, uh, many of the African countries that are represented here can, can uh, relate. Um, in fact, one of the most challenging things in Zambia at the moment is that um, previously the highest rate of uh, incidents was happening among truck drivers and prostitutes, but now it's actually among married couples with concurrent partnerships. So how to actually reach those um, groups is actually quite a difficult challenge. And there is a new technology that has actually been around for some time, but it is the only available method for women to, to protect themselves against HIV AIDS, which is uh, the female condom. But this is a technology that is rather difficult uh, to get adoption of. It's something that is new, it's a little bit hard to use at the beginning, it requires um, some kind of repeated interaction and some kind of repeated understanding. Um, and you really need some follow-up. So, uh, and the other part is, it's, it's important to think about who would be most at risk, for example, these married couples with concurrent partnerships and how to target them. So there are all these challenges facing this particular product. And the question is, what is the optimal distribution channel? Is there something in the private sector or embedded community agents that would allow us to be able to gain adoption of this um, product? And so, um, with PSI Zambia, uh, we have been using hairdressers and barbers. So those of you who are familiar with African context know that in many um, African uh, countries and, and cities, there are thousands of salons found in all neighborhoods. Um, and they have fantastic client relationships of people who are constantly coming back, which is key for targeting. And they have this repeated interaction where they are trusted and they have someone for a long period of time in which they're doing their hair. So there's a captive audience. Um, this is also settings where people are comfortable, more comfortable talking about um, intimacy and sex and health. And so this is a sort of very powerful setting in which to promote adoption of this product. But the question here is, um, how do we treat them? Do we treat them as regular distribution channels um, when the private sector giving them financial margins? Do we treat them as agents of change in the community? And those have implications for the kind of people we draw in by the incentives and the type of effort that they put in. So, for the field experiment, we uh, recruited and trained hairdressers and barbers across Lusaka to distribute female condoms in urban compounds. We then randomized the incentives across all the hairstylists into four treatment groups. So you've seen this randomization should come again and again, you'll see it in here. We randomize them, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we did the randomization across all the salons in Lusaka. Um, we did four treatment groups, and these sort of represent different theories, basically, of, of uh, incentive design. The first is a standard volunteer treatment. So this is a standard, perhaps, NGO model, where the idea is, you know, by getting people to volunteer, you're really selecting the people who are going to be the, kind of the ones who care most about it, who are going to be willing to do it for free and out of the goodness of their heart. Um, and then there are, you know, low financial incentives. So what is the smallest amount, a tiny kind of token margin that we could give to people um, that would allow them to kind of keep doing this work? And then we did a high-powered financial incentive. What if we just really ramp up the incentive financially and see how well that does? And then we did a fourth treatment, um, which is something that is not as much tested in the field, but is very important. I mean, intuitively, a lot of people think it's important. We have theory papers that suggest it's important, a lot of psychology that suggests it's important, very little evidence, which is social recognition and status in the community. So we were able to test against the others, and the questions we're able to answer by randomizing across these four treatment groups are the following. We can other these four different types of incentives draw in different types of people. So we actually measure um, each person's sort of what we call a pro-social uh, motivation. So we ask them about their previous in the baseline, we ask them about their activities <coughs> in the community, their charity activities, etc. We also do a behavioral experimental game with them when they come in for their training, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, that gets at some aspect of their sort of altruism. Um, and then, or you might think you may draw in more entrepreneurial types. 
and uh, ones who are really you know, gung-ho about starting a new business in which they get margins. And maybe those are not the ones who are going to be targeting the people you care about. So those are the types of questions that we want to be able to tease apart. The second thing that this allows us to do, for example, by looking at status versus the high and the low financial incentives, is to really benchmark how important social recognition is compared to a standard financial incentive. And the third and final thing really comes from the literature in psychology and behavioral economics that suggests that um, if you pay people this small amount, you actually might crowd out their own motivation for doing the task. So in some way, you're commodifying this thing that is coming out of the goodness of their heart, and you're making them feel bad about it in some way, and so they actually feel demotivated to do it. Mm. So by comparing the low financial incentives with the volunteer, we're able to see if financial incentives may actually crowd out their intrinsic motivation or not. So this is how we carried out the experiment. We surveyed all of the salons. We did a census of the, all of the salons in Lusaka, went around with geocoding, and so 2,500 salons. And then we randomly assigned 1,200 salons to four treatments. That's 1,200 salons because we had to have very large buffer regions, because you can imagine that we wanted to really um, make sure there was no spillover effects here. Um, then we invited them to training, where we collected further information, and we did this game that I mentioned to measure their intrinsic motivation. And then we did um, sales and monitoring. So for one year, every month, we went to them and restocked and did, did some monitoring data. Then we did a customer survey um, in all the marketplaces in which the salons took place. And finally, we did an online survey of all the salons. This is, again, the financial incentives that I can tell, and, and all the different incentives that I can tell you a little bit about more about, but we only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. This is the status incentives. So this was... <clears throat> And actually, we might, um, we might share a little bit more. I don't know if we, we can see how that, the timing goes. Um, but uh, no, OK, we'll do 10 minutes. Um, so so uh, basically, in the, in the status things, we, when you would sell, you would get these little gold stars that would rise on your thermometer that you would keep in your salon. Once you reached the top, you would get a ceremony that was actually with Dr. Peary that you could invite um, five of, your, of the people you'd like to bring um, to the ceremony. We asked them who they'd like to bring, if they wanted to bring hairstylists, they wanted to bring their peers in the community to these uh, ceremonies. So these are people in the salon. Um, like I said, we kept a, a large buffer zone of salons. We did an extensive training of business skills and health promotion. Um, and then we had a lot of sources of data. We've only just started to analyze this data. So what I'm showing you is sort of hot off the presses, very preliminary data using just the invoice and sales data, but at the moment we're gathering all the other sources of data. Um, the first finding is that because there was such a large take up of the program, we actually find no selection effects because 97% of the people um, took up the program. Uh, and there may be some other reasons for that, and we can talk about that. That's something that we focus a lot about on the CHLB project. The second finding is that status incentives are incredibly powerful. In fact, they are more effective than financial incentives. Um, and you can include all kinds of controls, and uh, it's just as strong. So you can see this, that um, agents in the status, uh, which is the yellow bar, restock twice as many condoms as any of the other treatment conditions. So this is an incredibly strong and powerful and robust effect of um, status. And we find no evidence of crowding out. So there's no <laughs> evidence that any kind of financial incentive actually works worse than uh, volunteer incentives. So we find that these can be really powerful. And, um, and we're now looking at, uh, looking at the long-term effects of potentially other health products and services that are not compensated, as well as the effects on the agents themselves because they report having effects and we want to sort of check the end line and see what effects it may have had on their own behavior. So as I said, you know, as we were doing this, the Ministry of Health um, approached me and asked uh, for us to, to collaborate on the community health worker strategy in Zambia. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a very strong um, issue there because of the high attrition rate. And they wanted to learn how to increase uh, retention. So this is a ministry-wide, actually, sort of Zambia-wide uh, initiative. 
Um, in this pilot stage, which is this year, there are 350 CHWs that have been recruited across the system that I'll talk about in a second, across 48 districts. So the first thing that we wanted to test was, does the way in which the government recruits these community health workers affect the type of community health, of the type of person that applies to this job and the type of person that is selected. So across these 48 districts, we randomized which message basically the district got about why to get involved in this program. So in half of the districts, they got a poster, several posters that went across their district that gave a service motivation, want to serve your community, become a community health worker. In the other half, they got a career-oriented poster, which was become a CHW to gain skills and boost your career. And the question we face here is, is there a difference in the type of people who applied to the program, and is there a difference in the kind of rankings that we had a whole system in which the Neighborhood Health Committee and then the District Health Office would rank the various candidates and who showed up. So that's the first aspect of just the types that are being drawn in. And um, in April, they'll be starting the training of all of them. So we're going to do a baseline survey, including many of the individual characteristics, as well as some of these behavioral games. And then we're going to measure effort through thinking about designing compensation. So after the sort of selection phase is really the, the challenge of designing compensation. Um, for political reasons, the base rate of compensation has been set for all of the community health workers. But um, the government would really like to think about innovative other aspects of compensation design. So we want to learn from the, what we've learned from this project regarding status and recognition within the community to be able to design that aspect. There may also be some performance pay, but that's sort of within a year's time. We have a year to basically design that aspect to really think what are the most important and interesting test there. So kind of in conclusion, just sort of taking these two things together, which as you can see are very much in progress, um, both of them, the, the issue is that innovative delivery channels can overcome many of the challenges facing global health, but it is critical to find the appropriate compensation because it can affect both the types of people who come and the type of effort that they put in, and of course the, the performance and ultimately the health outcome. Um, and so evaluating, when, when we go forward to evaluate the type of compensation, we need to look at both selection and impact on effort. Um, as we have learned, status and social recognition is a significant driver of pro-social behavior and can be leveraged in a very cost-effective way. So if you think about you know, the status incentives versus the financial incentives, there's a, it's actually much more cost-effective to use the status incentives. Um, and we can talk maybe in the discussion about what mechanism might be underlying how powerful the status incentives seem to be. And as I said, this is just really the beginning of uh, this journey to understand more about human resources and how to motivate uh, human resources in the health sector.